Now, when I looked at this passage of scripture today, I realized I'd bitten off more than I could chew. Um, so we are actually going to read um, from verse 12 all the way through to the end of the first chapter. Um, it's probably about three sermons. So I did say to the team this morning, um, three sermons, three 20 minute sermons, that's 60 minutes. Um, I've tried to just break that down a little bit more. So um, we'll see how we go. <laughs> that's cool. Um, let's read God's word together. If you've got it with you on your phone, your tablet, if you've actually brought a Bible, good on you. That's great. But let's read together. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Paul says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped the spread of the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some of our preaching out of jealousy, some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. For they preach with selfish ambition and not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and as the spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. Remember, Paul's in prison, in chains. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ, as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. This, um, this last week, I had the privilege of having a very good friend of mine um, from New Plymouth come and have lunch with us. It was a great time. He was uh, one of the guys in my 4x4 in the men's group that I was part of down there in New Plymouth when I was there. And so it was great um, to have him come. We, we, we used to have breakfast every week um, at McDonald's in our 4x4. So we'd turn up at McDonald's, have a time together. Um, we would encourage one another and we would pray together. And we spent so much time in his coming to us just on Monday to have lunch. We spent so much of our time together sharing the news 
as you do, you know, like what's been going on in your life and how things for you and what's been going on in my life and, and, and how, uh, you know, what, what's been happening in my life. And we, we had this chit chat going on and that's normal, right, isn't it? When you get to meet someone you haven't seen for a while, you catch up, it's great. It doesn't matter whether it's in person or whether you're on a phone call or a Zoom call or, uh, or even emails. You know, when you, when you haven't heard or seen this person for a while, you want to catch up. You want to find out what's going on with them. So when Paul sends his friends in the church a letter, what do you think they were expecting Paul to actually say? Oh, we've got a letter from Paul. Isn't that great? You see... The church had sent Epaphrodites to be with Paul. He was on house arrest and they wanted someone to go and serve Paul while he was in that situation. And so they had sent Epaphrodites with a gift from the church to help Paul's ministry and to help him in his time in, in, uh, under arrest. And so when, they, when Epaphrodites came back to the church with a letter from Paul, they were going to want to know, Paul, how's it been going? You know, have you been well? What's it like for you, you know, under house arrest? How are you coping with that? What's going on for you? But Paul doesn't do any of that. He doesn't have time for that, for this little chit chat that you might have of catching up with each other. The only thing that Paul wants him to know is that in his suffering, in his time in prison, in his time under house arrest, God has given him so many opportunities to advance the gospel. And after giving thanks to God in the beginning of his letter to them and praying for them, his main concern is this is what he wants them to know. It's almost like Paul only has so much paper to write on, so much time to give to writing this letter and so much ink that he's got to get to the main point quickly. He wants to pass on to the church the things they need to know. And so he starts, he says, I want you to know. He says, this, this is the most important thing for you to know. Now... You know, you've been a church together, you've been Christians for a while, and I want you to know that your citizenship is in heaven. There's just this one thing you need to do while you're here on this earth, and that is to serve Christ and to make him known. To serve Christ and to make him known. You now have this new purpose in life. It's not to serve self, but to know and to live for Christ and to tell others about him. And in this first section of this passage, we discover three things. That if we are devoted to the gospel, that if we're all sold out for God, then we will experience some kind of suffering for the sake of the gospel. Secondly, that God works through the suffering to advance the kingdom of God. And thirdly, that even though we might not always agree together in our theology or our worship styles or even how we sometimes live our lives, that as long as the gospel is being preached or being demonstrated in our lives, that's okay. See, one thing we know about Paul is he knew all about suffering. The new life that he had found in his relationship with Christ put him on a path of suffering. Falsely accused, violently attacked by a mob, tortured in prison, trials before religious leaders and governors and kings, shipped off to Rome for a trial with fear of ambush and, de and death, a violent storm at sea, again with the potential to die, then a shipwreck. Having survived a shipwreck, 
being bitten by a poisonous snake, yet surviving while everyone else around him was watching for when he would die. That's quite a bit of trials, quite a bit of suffering that Paul has going, gone through. But did that stop Paul? Not one bit. Did that halt Paul from sharing the gospel? No, it didn't. And was God with him through all of that? Absolutely he was. See, Paul sees everything that happens to him, not just as an attack from the enemy, which it was, because the enemy doesn't want the gospel to be shared throughout the world. But rather, Paul saw this as God's way of providing him with others around him who needed to hear the message of Jesus, who needed to be set free, who needed to be saved. For Paul, God was at work, even in the midst of his suffering, to advance the good news of Jesus. Like I say, at the time of writing this letter to the church in Philippi, Paul is imprisoned in Rome and being constantly guarded. For two years, Paul was chained or confined by a guard in eight-hour shifts. That means that every day there were three guards on an eight-hour shift. Over that time, I would say that's probably quite a lot of guards that Paul has been chained to or has had, you know, opportunity to demonstrate the good news of Jesus to. And there were people that were, were, were able to come and minister to Paul while he was on home attention, as it were, detention. And so he had the opportunity to share his story, his life, to share his faith to those who he could. He talks about it. Even the prison guards, hundreds of them, he's had the opportunity to preach the gospel to. Out of his pain came the opportunity for the gospel to change other people's lives. It's the same for you and I. You know, we go through pain, we go through suffering in, in times in our lives. But God wants to use those times. God wants to use those moments, those times when God has walked with you through those things that you've gone through. You have a story to share. You have a testimony, a witness to God's faithfulness and goodness. It's an amazing story that came out of a, um, a number of years ago. A story of Jim and Elizabeth and Valerie Elliott. It's a reasonably modern day story of Paul and the suffering that he went through. If you know the story, you'll remember that Jim and four of his friends flew into Ecuador to take the gospel to the Alka tribe. All four of them, after trying to make contact with the people, lost their lives after being attacked by some of their warriors. This would seem to be a devastating result. After all of the prayer, after all of the planning that went on into their mission, because they believed this was God's purpose for them. And it didn't turn out the way that they had hoped for. However, just a few years later, Elizabeth, the wife of Jim, and his daughter, Valerie, went back to the tribe. The Orca people couldn't believe that they would come back, especially after what they had done. And this resulted in them accepting the two women who went and lived with them in their villages, lived with them in their tribe, and who learned their language, and who wrote their language down, and who translated it into scripture, and who taught them to read the scriptures. They brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people. And through their love and their care for these people, the gospel was heard, and even in the face of the loss and the hardship that they suffered, many of those tribal people came to to know Jesus. You know, in our Western culture and in our lives today, we don't usually have to face 
such suffering as Paul or the Eliots did. But you know as well as I do that we face opposition. Where the gospel is being preached, there will always be opposition. The reason for that is because we have an enemy who doesn't want the gospel to be preached. He will do anything to prevent us from sharing the truth about Jesus with those that God is preparing their hearts to listen to what we have to say. Paul says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that happens to you is a means of helping you share the gospel. Bad news that the enemy means for harm can be turned into good news through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember sitting in an office with three medical specialists, two senior nurses and a surgeon when they told my dad that he had colon cancer. There were two options. He could have an operation, which at his age, they couldn't say he would pull through it. Or he could live out the rest of his life being helped with whatever came his way and they would help him to deal with it. This was bad news. My dad's immediate reaction was to say, I don't want an operation. Now, for some people that might seem like a defeatist kind of attitude of giving up, but it wasn't. And I knew my dad. I knew that he made that choice because he knew what his future was. And I knew that this was an opportunity in a room where all these people were gathered to give him the bad news, I wanted to share the good news. And so I did. I told them about his faith and that death was not the end of life, but just a transition to a better life. And I told them about Jesus and the difference that he makes in our lives if we accept him. Like Paul, I had a captured audience and God gave me the courage and the boldness to share the gospel. I didn't have to worry about the results. All I had to do was share the gospel and allow the Holy Spirit to do what he does best, which is to open up the hearts of those who hear. So when you're suffering for the sake of the gospel, be it a ridicule or a rejection or that feeling that people think somehow or other you're this crazy person that believes in something that is just way too beyond their understanding. Maybe it could be that you lose a friend through your faith in Christ, or a loss of your job, or whatever it might be. Paul says it is a joy to be able to turn that around into a story that God's faithfulness and blessing as he walks with you through the deepest valley, God answers your prayers or gives you the strength to endure and then he shows you how to use that testimony that witnesses to other people. I just want to touch a little on what Paul says about those others that he talks about in this passage of scripture. Those others who don't have pure motives or hold to the same way of thinking or style that we might have. And yet he doesn't focus on the differences. I, I think about um, in days gone by, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a great evangelist, as, you, as many of you know. And he would go into cities and he would preach the gospel. And there's been times when Billy Graham has come under a lot of attack by the local churches in that area saying, we don't need this guy to come and preach the gospel in our city. We, we, can, we can do that ourselves. And their problem was that Billy Graham would come in and hundreds and thousands of people would be saved. And then the church had the problem of dealing with all these people that had been saved. And they didn't want that. But it was too much work. It was too, much, too difficult for them to do that. 
And so they had this differing opinion of someone coming in and preaching the gospel. I think Paul felt a little bit like that too in his day. There's been times when um, people have made comments, other churches have made comments, or people have made comments about Alpha. And what, you know, the fact that Alpha doesn't do this or Alpha doesn't do that. But one thing Alpha does do is proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are many denominations and churches who have different practices and even different applications of the scripture. But it's really important for the wider body of Christ to hold fast to the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus came to save people. And he wants us to be part of that salvation plan. You know, I've been really blessed and filled with joy over the past year or so as every day I drive past the Catholic Church just down the road and I see that lovely big illuminated sign that they have outside their church and it says, Welcome to Alpha. To see them running the Alpha course where the gospel is being proclaimed. To see their passion. To see their people come to know Jesus. It's amazing. And it's been a real joy for me to see that. I understand that their aim is that all Catholics within their diocese would do the Alpha course. And that through doing that, many others will come to faith in Jesus. I love that. And I think we've got to hold on to the main thing. We are here, Paul says, to preach the gospel of Jesus. Secondly, uh, for Paul, suffering and prayer go hand in hand. In his letter to the church at Ephesus, when he's explaining about his suffering in prison, he says this, Pray in the Spirit at all times. And on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. That's in Ephesians 6, 18. And in our passage here this morning, Paul says, For I know that as you pray for me, the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, and this will lead to my deliverance. Now, you think about what Paul was actually thinking there. This will lead to my deliverance. He was maybe potentially thinking about two things that could happen to him. He either lives by the grace of God and the prayers of the people, or he dies at the hands of the authorities and is ushered into the presence of Jesus. For Paul, whatever happens, he's trusting in God for his future knowing that through the prayers of others, God will be faithful to him. Paul fully expects, as the people pray for him, that there will be a miracle that results in him staying alive because Paul sees that as the greater answer to their prayers as he will then be able to continue the work that God's called him to do and to encourage and support the churches as well as to advance the gospel. However, should that not work out for him, his departure, he believes, is what he calls an even better solution. Paul holds on to the hope that God always knows best. To be able to be in such a close relationship with Jesus and to understand what Paul is meaning when he says, for me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better and I'm torn between these two desires. I either live my life for Christ or I go to be with him. Now that's a mindset that can only be grasped and sustained through faith and through trust that comes as a result of faithful prayers. And Paul asks for prayer from his church because he knows that it's prayer that sustains and enables him. It is their prayers that releases the power of God through the work of the Holy Spirit for him to endure in life or in the face of death. We all need people praying for us. And we all need that praying to activate the power 
and the grace and the saving work of the Holy Spirit so that we too can do God's work until that day when we will say, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Now, Lynn and I, over the last five years, have lost our prayer warriors, our parents. They've gone. We know they prayed for us every day. And we're so grateful and thankful for that. And if you're here this morning and you're a parent, you need to be praying for your children. No matter what they're going through, what's happening in their life, pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. As Paul says, prayer makes the difference. And I remember when, you know, that prayer does bring miracles. We know that. We've been praying for that this morning, that God would bring a miracle, give us a miracle. I remember when I was in so much pain with back injury that it was almost unbearable. And I had the church praying for me. I had our parents praying for me. And I felt that prayer. And God gave me a word as the Holy Spirit spoke to the lady that was my physiotherapist. (laughs) And I was going to see her because of my bad back. And she gave me a word that I realized was God speaking to me. Those prayers that activated the Spirit of God to speak change into my life and into the direction of my life. God speaks to us in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of the things that we're going through in our life. God speaks to us and it's activated through prayer. And when I became obedient to that word, then I saw the miracle of healing. Prayer is like a light switch. When it's turned on, it allows the power to flow to the light. It activates God's power to bring people to salvation. And if you're trusting God to save a family member, I want to say to you this morning, keep praying for them. The church in Philippi never stopped praying that people would come to know Jesus through Paul's ministry. So pray for Alpha as they gather on a Monday and a Wednesday. Pray for them that God would activate the Spirit of God to save people. Pray for the toy library. Pray that as people come in through the doors of the toy library, they will sense the presence of God. There'll be something there that will turn them around and change their lives forever. Pray for the group that meets on Thursday, the crafters group, as people come into this place and as they journey with them and as they fellowship together and as they have opportunities to share their story with them. Pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, will speak into the lives of those who come. For all of our ministries here in this church, we need to be in prayer because that's where God is at work amongst us. And I believe that, you know, as we pray for our children, God, especially if they're going through tough times or if, if, they're, if they're not saved yet, I believe that as we pray, God will bring people across their paths. I remember years ago we were praying for our children and, and, and they were going off on the wrong tangent and God brought into one of my boys' lives this young girl. And, and you know, you always wonder, well, what is God doing here with this, with this you know? But her parents were Christians and she grown up in a church and, and, and her parents had gone overseas on some missions trips and you know and eventually we found out this was great our son wasn't walking with the Lord but then we get this call dad I'm getting baptized what when on Sunday right we'll be there One, just because God brought someone into his life that could speak into his situation God will do that. We need to encourage and we need through prayer um, to be just lifting them up that God would bring someone alongside them to encourage them. We must continue to pray to believe that the Holy Spirit will work in power so that we can be testimonies and witnesses of his goodness. 
We must expect that the Spirit will work in surprising ways, meeting our individual needs and that of others. In his own unique way, God works. There is no one right way with God because he works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. You know, unfortunately, I think as a, as a church, not as a church, Franklin Baptist, I mean as a church, a wider body, we've been very quick to judge where, what we see the Spirit of God doing in other places. Signs and wonders, miracles should be welcomed, even expected, not explained away. The gift of tongues should not be something weird or strange. That's what I thought it was. You know, when I first heard it, I thought, this is weird. This is strange. And when it happened to me, it was even stranger. But tongues is not something that's weird or strange. It's something we should cherish because it's our language of speaking to God. The manifestations of the Spirit as it comes, you know, whether it's in tears or in joy, whether it's in a shaking experience or a sense of heat that some people feel when the Spirit of God comes on them. Whether it's the laughter that comes through, the, knowing the joy of the Spirit of God in our life. Or however it comes, we should just be seeing, we should just be really pleased and excited when we see God at work through His Spirit amongst us. After all, the Bible talks of burning bushes speaking to people. It talks of donkeys speaking to people. It talks of multiplying food, which gave them the ability to preach the gospel, and turning water into wine. Those things were different. They were unusual, but they were it was the Spirit of God at work so that the gospel could be shared. I love the story in Acts 3, 1, 11, where we see Peter and John at the gates of the temple. And we, we see them reaching out and touching someone's life and it being transformed. And then, Paul, and then um, Peter says in, in chapter 4, verse 4, in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, it says, but many of the people who heard their message, because Peter preached the gospel as a result of that miracle. Many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled 5,000 men plus all the women and the children. The power of a story is significant. What's your story? What is your story? What has God given to you to share with other people that the gospel might be spread abroad? You have a story. Use that story. When you come into contact with people, day after day, God has a story he wants you to share because it's your story that's going to touch the hearts of those people that he brings across your path. I want to close with this amazing story Oh, a couple of scriptures, actually, and then a story. Romans twelve nineteen to 20 says this. Because it's so important, really, that when we are proclaiming the gospel, that we live the kind of lives that God expects us to live. And sometimes we don't always do that. And Paul knew that. He's, Paul said, even I... Don't do what God calls me to do or wants me to do. Even I struggle with that at times. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Dear friends, never take revenge, for I am the one, says the Lord, who pays back. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Doing good is a sign that you are living under the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Peter, 1 Peter, it says this in 1 Peter 3, And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. 
but do this in a gentle and a respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Jesus Christ. We know that our God is a big God. We know that he can fight the battles for us. All we need to do is to speak the truth and do what is respectful in the eyes of God. And then God can work for us. There's this amazing story that comes from the second century of a Christian philosopher called Athenagoras of Athens. He was one of the early church fathers. And he went to plead the case of the Christian's exemplary life, of their love for the people and their unwillingness to retaliate against opposition and those who wronged them. He went to the then Roman emperors to ask them to stop the persecutions of Christians. In stating his case, he said this, how many philosophers or educated thinking advisors do you know who have so purified their own hearts as to love their enemies instead of hating them, to turn the other cheek to those who first insulted them, to bless them and to pray for those who plot against them? He then went on to describe the attitude and the reaction of the believer, regardless of the opposition that they faced within their society. With us, he said, on the contrary, you will find unlettered people, tradesmen and old women, who though unable to express in words the advantages of our teaching, they demonstrate by the acts, their acts, the value of their principles. For they do not rehearse speeches, but they evidence good deeds. When struck, they do not strike back. When robbed, they do not sue. To those who ask, they give, and they love their neighbors as themselves. As the Christians lived among the people within those communities, even though they faced opposition, those people saw the difference that it made in the life of a believer. And it was only a hundred years later that the Roman Emperor Constantine accepted the Christian faith, which soon after became the official religion of the Roman Empire. What we need today is more people like Athenagoras, who will stand and who will speak on behalf of all believers to a governing authority that's becoming more and more unaware of or even rejecting the Christian character which is being eroded in our nation. Now this is not political <laughs> talk. This is the fact that we need people to stand up in our nation as Christians and say this is what we believe. Those who are in, in places of authority and power need our prayers. Our government, and especially through this election time, they need our prayers because prayer makes a difference. And we as Christians need to live out that Christian character so that the difference between us and what we are experiencing in our world today is something that is powerful and attractive. For the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit is in you, is in me, is in us, is in our story, in our words that we speak, in the actions that we do, and through the power of prayer, we can and we will make a difference. We will bring change, we will bring transformation, if we live our lives the way Jesus calls us to, the way of the gospel of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this morning we want to acknowledge, God, that at times we failed you in this area. Like Paul says, you know, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong. But Father, we pray that today as we stand before you, we want to surrender again our lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Surrender our lives to the work that you've called us to do. 
that God in our life and through our life, in our words that we speak, in our actions, that we will indeed be a light in the midst of darkness, that we will indeed carry that light into this world because Jesus makes a difference. We bless you and thank you in your mighty name. Amen.